Hi, welcome to World Trader Update 2. I'll be uploading World Trader pretty much every week when I have the time, just going over a few of the issues and areas in the world that I've checked out in the previous seven days. And a lot of you have probably heard about the Malaysian airplane disaster and seen the contradiction, contradictory stories in the newspaper. You've seen here the Malaysian civil aviation chief, Abdul Rahim, told a press conference that five passengers checked in for the flight but didn't uh, end up boarding the plane and they took their baggage off and then the next 24 hours, 48 hours, they changed their mind and said that no one came to the airport that didn't uh, want to go on the aeroplane. And then it's there was another story as well about uh, three people waiting for a ticket. The people that cancelled managed to get on the flight as well. And then a, a top military official was quoted as saying they tracked the plane over the Straits of Malacca. I remember reading that in CNN, the Wall Street Journal, and then the next day the Air Force chief uh, denied saying military ra radar had tracked the plane over the Straits of Malacca. So some very strange going-ons concerning this plane disappearance. A lot of contradictory stories coming from the Chinese, the Vietnamese, the Malaysians, the Western newspapers, not sure what's going on or who's uh, controlling the story or who's not allowing what to come out. It's very difficult to see. But here the Wall Street Journal cited sources in the US government to claim that the engine data automatically transmitted by the aircraft indicated that it remained airborne for a total of five hours. And then in another Wall Street Journal article, it cited sources in the US government said that Rolls-Royce had received an aircraft health report every 30 minutes for five hours. Um, and you can see here, this is partly to do with trading as well. A lot of articles on Bloomberg, Reuters, AP, they always cite some official and it just goes to show you every time the Malaysians have a press conference, they deny um, that officials from Rolls-Royce said this or they deny that US government officials um, um, have ever said to them these particular uh, issues. So it is very strange. And then Rupert Murdoch, uh, March the 9th, before really any of this was known apart from very sketchy information, all this came out above what I was showing you here about the Wall Street Journal on the 12th, and some of it uh, late in the evening on the 11th. But on Rupert Murdoch's Twitter account, he confirms jihad's turning to make trouble for China, chance for US to make common calls, befriend China while Russia bullies. That's a very, um, yeah, well, it's, you know, it's quite a harsh comment, you know, considering people may have died uh, on the actual aeroplane. But just reading more into it, I'm not going to do that. Um, and I'm not quite sure what's going on or whose agenda. But one thing I do know, there is a lot of missing people out there. And there's a lot of information coming from a lot of different sources. And they all seem to be contradicting each other. And th these people are looking in the Malacca Straits here. Where my mouse is, is Malaysia. This is Indonesia. Banda Aceh, where the huge tsunami and earthquake came from. Um, and they're looking in this direction. And this was a couple of days after the incident, which seemed very strange considering the Malaysians, um, Malaysian military said that they never tracked the plane over Malaysia into the Malacca Straits. If that was the case, then why are they looking for the plane here? And why are they sending uh, ships into that location? So there's some very contradictory statements coming from Malaysia as well. And this guy, Mike McKay, uh, seems to be the best verif verifiable eyewitness, works on an oil rig just off the coast of Vietnam in the Gulf of Thailand, said he saw the plane. You can read his witness statement um, online, Mike McKay, and it seems to be a very trustworthy, viable eyewitness. Who knows, may maybe, um, yeah, uh, maybe uh, he is not uh, necessarily who he says he is, um, but it seems quite genuine and that seems to be the area where the plane should have been. Um, where all this data coming out about Rolls-Royce sending 
signals every 30 minutes about the engine. That should be the case, and there, surely you would have thought something like that would would have happened. But Malaysian officials have said that Rolls Royce have uh, told them that that's not the case, and they, that wasn't the case. Um, so it seems very strange. This is a graph from flight radar, a map showing where the last contact was at around half one, supposedly, and the oil rig is just up here, and the guy said he saw a, uh, a plane in flames, and then the flames went out, and if that was the case, he said it was a full plane, it wasn't broken up, it would have sunk to the bottom of the ocean, and this was the original area where they were looking, but the map I showed you in the previous slide with the two Asian guys, where my mouse is here, this is where they were looking. They must be looking uh, there for a reason, so it's all very strange. And you can see this graph here, this map was put on by me about three days ago. And these were the areas that they were looking, the Malacca Straits. In yellow it says initial search. So these were the initial search areas, but the Malaysian military again um, as I showed you on the slide before, have denied that they tracked the plane across the Malacca Straits. If that's the case, then why have they, or why is this area being mapped? And I thought this is good. This is the latest update from Thursday, 5:49 p.m. I believe that was Malaysian time, and the Chinese are even getting involved now with putting out information about wreckage found on satellites. If you read the top part here where my mouse is and then you read the bottom point number nine, the Malaysians sent out resources to go and look uh, for the wreckage that the Chinese said that they had found. Now there's false uh, rumours and um, maybe malicious rumours coming from all camps as far as I can see at the moment and it's very hard to work out uh, you know who who is uh, potentially behind this but I think this sums it up these points um, you read in the Wall Street Journal and CNN and other uh, organizations like Reuters this official said that official said point number three I'm looking at based on the last transmission which was at 107 local time it did not r run beyond that Rolls-Royce and Boeing was called in to assist and they have verified this. So how comes the Wall Street Journal are saying that an official from Rolls-Royce and the US government said they tracked the plane uh, for four to five hours after? So it just seems very strange. Maybe it's just a case of misorganization, but as always, there's plans within plans. Um, but it would be nice to find out what has actually happened uh, to those poor people and uh, my sympathies go out to family members. Margin borrowed, CPI adjusted. This is a chart that, w that was out in November the 30th 2013 and you can see the way um, the spike parabolic margin lending has gone up uh, tremendously in the last year really, last year and a half where it where it had flattened out a little bit um, but again, jumping the gun just from one source of evidence isn't a way to go, but it is something to add to the overall picture, um, evidence confirming that you know, very soon this bull market will come to an end. And when I say very soon, it, it could take another uh, six, six months to a year of volatility, perhaps with a new high. There's lots of stories to come, I'm sure. And all this tells me, this chart here, um, is that borrowing since the 90s has gone up tremendously. We know that. I mean, you just need to look at a gold chart to see that as well. Um, but there's nothing to say that margin couldn't drop off or margin couldn't increase significantly from here as well. Uh, but probability would suggest, because we're the fifth year of a bull market um, into the sixth, um, you're looking at margin borrowing levels extremely high, then a lot of the stocks um, that I've been trading the last three to four years, they're in their third, fourth and fifth stages of their bull cycle. Uh, so the evidence is amounting to a general turn in the market, but it's very hard to predict a general turn. 
like in 1929, Livermore was short in the autos and they turned over and rolled over, I believe, before a lot of other stocks. And with an index, an average of stocks, you're not going to get them all rolling over at the same time. Um, the only thing I can think as well on the horizon that's you know, quite negative, it doesn't look like any of the issues have been sorted out between uh, the Ukraine and Russia. And I was reading a few articles, which we'll get into in a minute on Wednesday, about how the tensions have eased. And they were complete fabrication trying to rope people back into Oppenheimer mutual funds and those types of uh, different investments. But we'll get on to that in a minute. This is another chart um, adjusted for inflation, supposedly. That's the thing with charts as well. You can be very misled by charts and you have to be careful at what type of chart you're looking at. We always talk about parameters, but it's the same with these types of charts as well. Um, you know, people make them to their own equations, so to speak. Uh, but this chart looks quite nice and it just shows you uh, the ever expanding margin and it had steadied out. And as the market's gone up, the juice has kept going interactive brokers if you've got a, a, a trading account over a hundred thousand they offer you special margin privileges that the average Joe uh, doesn't get but most people uh, do trade with a lot of margin if they're quite active traders whereas I know a lot of people who have taken risk off the table in the last three or four years and invested more in productive land and businesses that turn over an income and grow and this is what I've observed during the week. Many news articles about, about the great value P ratios, etc., in Russian stock in the Russian stock market. Um, again, just like a chart, fundamentals can be heavily manipulated. Just because someone says a P ratio is such, it doesn't mean that it is such. Simply because of data, what is the reality of the situation? Cash in the bank, assets on hand, liquidity. Everything could be Alice in Wonderland. Yeah, you just don't know how far the rabbit hole goes. Just think about America, Enron, WorldCom. You could spend an hour listing the companies with false accounting. And you just think how bad it is in Russia. You know, it's 20, 30 times worse than it is in America. The accounting standards in Russia and the corporate governance is abysmal. The Estonian foreign minister seems to be a Russian agent. The only reason I say that is because of the call that was released uh, at the back end of last week uh, with Baroness Cathy Ashtown, where he introduced into the conversation that agents from the Maidan protesters could have shot uh, some of those protesters in the square because police officers were shot as well by sniper. And he mentioned that a doctor on the scene, uh, Olga, had told this to him. That was his only, say, evidence, so to speak, that he mentioned to Cathy Ashtown uh, concerning this. And the point I wanted to bring up there immediately, about two hours later, uh, the doctor, whose name is Olga, who was operating on all the protesters in the church, uh, never treated any of the back route, the riot police. So, number one, the Estonian foreign minister has got caught out there telling a porky. Um, he said to Cathy Ashtown that she treated um, riot police officers with the same injuries as the protesters. Now, that's the point that I'm arguing. I'm not arguing anything else. The fact is, she came out and sternly denied that, and, and I understand why, because she was in an area that was totally encased so to speak that was where the protesters were going to be treated from their bullet wounds she was the head doctor there and why would they bring riot police there for her to be treated and she said that herself she treated no riot police so how could she have told the Estonian foreign minister um, that the riot police suffered the same wounds as the protesters so that's the number one fib that's been caught out and the second fib is that I don't think the at the present time the Ukrainian secret services could have tapped the phone call I don't think they would have had that capability so you're left with two options there and I think the most plausible option is the Estonian foreign minister take that conversation and it was released at a certain time and there was big headlines 
uh, from Russia today and other types of organisations about conspiracies in terms of who shot the protesters, but they failed to follow up on the actual doctor who was mentioned in the report, her eyewitness statement saying that she never treated any of the riot police guys. So that's something uh, that I noticed during the week, the slow systematic removal of possessions from Yankovic's compound, uh, YouTube videos out there, maybe some of them have been doctored, I don't know the authenticity of, of some of them, but he's clearly seen in some of the videos, and it doesn't look like he's under heavy machine gun fire at all. He's packing up his possessions, I mean, a, a pharaoh wouldn't, wouldn't have had as many riches as he had, and they took, I think, over three days to pack trucks uh, full of antiques and paintings at Yankovic's residence and he oversaw some of that as well but he told the national media that he'd basically been run out of town and the second thing I wanted to bring up concerning that as well is I can't figure out once Yankovic got to Crimea if he'd have said to the Crimeans if, if they truly wanted to be part of Russia or they, they were that way to lean towards an ethnic Russian speaker from the Ukraine, then why didn't Yankovic stay in the Crimea and organise the rebellion? Where were these Crimean defence forces when Yankovic was actually in the Crimea? Crimea? Why did he run to Russia? Why didn't he organise everything from the Crimea if the people felt that strongly about it? And the reason is, is because the guy who's now going to be Prime Minister of Crimea, um, Asnov, um, used to run the Russian Unity Party and he only had 4% four, four of the vote, 3 seats out of 100. If the people of the Crimea wanted uh, to completely move over to Russia, he would have received more votes. It was a free and fair, it was a free pretty much and fair election in 2010. His name of his party was the Russian unity party i mean why didn't he win more votes you know why this why this uh, sudden everyone wants to be part of russia which is a complete fabrication you know in a lot of different ways the tartars the younger ukrainians the younger russians there there's a lot of people that just want to keep the status quo and you can see today the queues at the bank in the, in simfropol uh, apparently the rumour is, I'm not sure, I haven't had this confirmed, but they're going to nationalise banks in Crimea. It's really going to take a backward step. There was a lot of hope I had for Russia and its way of doing business quite a while back, you know, with the 10% tax rates and other areas. But, you know, I just heard too many people that have been um, roughed up in terms of their corporate documents and their assets seized over the years for it to be um, for it not to be considered systematic and that's what it is to do business in in Russia is to dance with the devil at the moment because there's so many criminal gangs that will come and try and steal your assets and you know they're basically officials they wear uniforms and it's a very very dangerous place to do business um, and also I just wanted to mention as well people talk about um, America invading Iraq and that's fine but Merkel again if people remember was against that war and she's come out very strongly against Russia and then also uh, Hollander and other people like Cameron they weren't around for the Iraq war um, even though Cameron did back it but one thing you have to bear in mind why it's totally different in, in a lot of different ways is no one was looking to annex the territory of Iraq this is clearly the territory of the Ukraine and that's why this is a huge difference and why this is going to blow up into a massive big deal and that's why I think things are just simmering and uh, people are taking their positions like on a chessboard the Ukrainians are getting their army ready Russia are encircling the Ukrainian borders America's moved warplanes to Poland Russia's moved warplanes to Belarus uh, there's 16 countries doing NATO exercises off the coast of Norway. There's warships in the Gulf of Thailand. Um, so you can see that there's a lot of different things going on um, uh, around all this that the media aren't picking up on, where it could escalate quite, quite, um, quite unfortunately. Uh, puppet leaders turning around and back, backstabbing their backers. 
what comes to mind is uh, Mikhail Kordoski because he was th he was the guy really that backed Putin from the second round of oligarchs. Putin, Putin got ra rid of his uh, first backers, the people that backed him, and he backstabbed the first round of oligarchs. And Kodosky was the second round of oligarchs that he backstabbed after taking their money and, and doing other things as well. But, you know, there's, there's a lot more behind that uh, to bring up. But I just wanted to bring up the fact that people might say America put puppet prime ministers in these countries but if you look at Karzai, Malake, they um, are and do favour um, European Western interests there's no questions of that but the second point is you can clearly see as well that they care for their people you know they're not complete puppets no one's annexed their territory so to speak and that that is a big distinction yeah, this is Kordoski, and this was uh, written, uh, I think, as he was in a, a kind of similar halfway house uh, about a month or two just before he was released from prison. And it was with a journalist, uh, Ben Judea. Um, but I think it's a very interesting article, and people should read it. Um, I'm not saying because Kordoski's come out, and then what happened in the Maiden, you can put two and two together. Uh, but so sometimes when you step on a lot of different people like Putin has you make a lot of enemies and I think you can just if you read these little quotes uh, from the article you can quite clearly see that Kordovsky is not going to let bygones be bygones and Putin's made a very powerful enemy there and it was probably a tactical mistake releasing him from prison he's got a lot of friends um, and he's a very powerful person I wouldn't be surprised to see him at some point as potentially the next Prime Minister of Russia or at least the backer of the next Prime Minister of Russia but check out the article there in the link and see for yourself some of the quotes and see what you think as well but when you spent a year and a half on the Moscow oh sorry on the Russian Chinese border um, and then another year and a half in bogs on the Finnish Russian border you, you're going to build up a lot of time to think of different ways to take care as he calls it of external irritations uh, but I think he's a very cold calculated very intelligent man and I think Putin has made a big tactical mistake uh, releasing him from prison but just to mention this guy Ben Judea he wrote a piece in the New York Times basically condemning London about how we weren't going to crack down because the Russians have invested so much and they basically own us. Uh, but what he failed to mention in his article was the fact that the UK has stood against Russia. You know, we've taken in some of these oligarchs like Boryovsky and not just people with loads of money as well. The Russian colonel guy that got poisoned with the polonium. Uh, we've taken in a lot of people that's pissed off the Russian state. Uh, so Ben Judea, if he wanted to write an unbiased piece, uh, surely should have mentioned that fact as well. And also the fact is as well that uh, London's built on the free market system. The guy sounds to me, I'm not sure of his background, but he sounds to me uh, like a little bit socialist, uh, a little bit left wing. You know, we'd destroy our city if, if uh, you know, we were to run it basically like like he's talking about and then also he's got a bit of a cheek as well because he's saying that London and the UK are you know bowing down to the Russian oligarchs whereas this guy Ben Judeas let Kordoski who was a Russian oligarch uh, perhaps you could uh, term him as, as still a Russian oligarch he's let him a free, a free open article without criticising some of his practices uh, you know b before he became this Nelson Mandela type figure um, he had a pretty shady past as well but Ben Judea doesn't mention any of that you know so he's he's one of those journalists not you know not a hundred percent sure about um, but I would say of Kordoski he seems very intelligent less thuggish than the usual uh, Putin backer so to speak he seems like a very nice guy in terms of his attitude very intelligent calculating 
And, you know, Russia could do a lot worse, probably, than have someone like Kordoski in charge for a few years, someone that could reform and make Russia into a free market country. This is JP Morgan, Russian Securities, listed in London. Basically, it's an investment trust that lists on Russian securities. And you can see the consolidation area that built up for a couple of years and then the massive tank downwards out of that consolidation area. Although that it, it's at a point where you could call it pivotal, I would say that this downward move here um, is signifying that perhaps in a couple of weeks there's more movement on the downside to come. I wouldn't be speculating in this, so to speak, but if you look at where my mouse is here, the 750, you've got the top point here, then you've got here where my mouse is, the low point of this cycle, and then you've got here, the top point here. When it breaks this point here, we'll call this the pivotal point where my mouse is. Uh, that will be the point that the market needs to be watched very carefully um, because you know things are building up you know it's a bit of a tinderbox uh, the world at the moment and even if it's just a sanction based game um, that's going to be played as of next week um, it's going to affect the world economy in many different ways and you can see it here on the monthly you look at the huge shakeout back in 2008 2009 and then you've got the lower highs one here one here one here people dumping perhaps their units into the market their shares and it looks like this was a distribution triangle but we'll only be able to tell I mean if things get all sorted out and everything's hunky-dory this may well be a good buying point but I don't see things playing out like that at the moment things are it's too early to say anything like that at all and this is a poster that they've got up in the Ukraine, I had to laugh. The Crimea, you know, choose the new administration in Ukraine, even though that's not an option on the ballot, which is completely false. The, the option is become independent or become part of Russia. It doesn't give you a third option, I believe, of being part of Ukraine. So this is very misleading as well. Uh, but it says, you know, fascists and Nazis, or you, you can be wrapped in the Russian flag and have your banks nationalised. Um, the thing I would say there is uh, Ukrainian's new leader is, is partly Jewish. Um, a lot of people that he's put into power, power again, because usually Jews are at the top echelon of the business community, are Jewish. You cannot say the government, yeah, sure there's fringes um, that are far right, but the, in the main, um, most of them are just, just what you would call uh, people that are proud and uh, respectful of their country and they're trying to implement that obviously and, and trying to get that little bit of nationalism out to the rest of uh, the Ukraine as well but you, I don't think a poster like that <laughs> in today's society it just it just sums up how bad things are and I watched an RT video of Putin summoning a, a businessman to sign a contract and I just couldn't believe that he called this guy in front of the cameras and said you come here and sign this contract right now here's my pen and he looked at him like a gangster and there was a lot of people saying great we need more people like that but they don't understand you can't have a society built like that it might seem good for a while kicking the asses of some of these bankers and businessmen but you stop being productive as a country you'll soon feel it in a couple of years because what happens is Russian businessmen um, move abroad they won't do business anymore and all the productive people end up leaving the country and it falls apart and people don't want to invest in there and then you end up somewhere like Venezuela and then people blame everyone else uh, look at Venezuela you, you've got um, countries that are friendly to them like Brazil, Argentina, many countries over the years but they still couldn't organise their own house but they'll still blame America and say, oh, it's all their fault. You know, we should be allowed to give people free flat screen TVs. I mean, their government, what I said to you is, is completely true. That's what the minister said. Everyone should be able to have a flat screen TV. These, you know, it's all a, a conspiracy. I mean, 
the thing is, Iran's been in a lot worse a position than Venezuela. Venezuela could trade with many different countries and they still couldn't sort it out and prove that their wonderful socialistic system is the best. But they keep blaming the fascists and uh, people trying to unsettle the government. And it wouldn't be that way. If they looked after the people, the people wouldn't be rebelling against them. And I, I've watched you know, documentaries from the other side of the perspective, like the revolution will not be tele uh, televised with Hugo Chavez. And I understand what goes on, but people have to understand as well that you can either live in a regime like Fidel Castro, um, or you can live somewhere where you've got 96, 97 percent of your freedoms intact. So that that's that's why you'll get people trying to s unsettle regimes like Hugo Chavez because they know the writing's on the wall and what what's round the corner. Not only for their wealth but for their country as well. And that and that's why you get coups and and other types of issues. But if a country's strong and it takes care of its people, then you won't have uh, coups and uprisings. And there's Kordoski, you know, from that interview with Ben Judea. Well, it was really um, a mouthpiece for, what, for whatever Kordoski wanted to say. Uh, you can see him there in the Maiden Square, walking around, you know, in the thick of the action, out of prison, and uh, he's in a country now. He's got a lot of experience at building countries up from the ground up, and uh, he's a very smart, intelligent man. The guy on the right looks like a, a Russian tycoon as well that pissed Putin off not so long back as well. I'm not too sure. Kabinsky, I think his name was. But Putin's made some powerful enemies, and there's a lot of Russian businessmen around the world that would love to go back to Russia and do business there. And once Putin's out of the way, they'll bring a lot of wealth back to Russia. But that's why you've seen a lot of the money leaving in the last couple of years, because these people aren't stupid. I'm not talking about Kodosky, I'm talking about other Russian businessmen that have moved money out of Russia. You know, it's very unusual not to meet a Russian businessman without at least seven passports. And that's no exaggeration, because they know themselves how authoritarian, you know, wake, Putin wakes up on the wrong side of the bed or thinks you've been dipping your finger in too many pies, you might end up like Boryeski or other oligarchs that backed him and he turned around and stabbed him in the back. This was an interesting quote from the Chinese I picked up about five, six days ago. The Korean Peninsula is right on China's doorstep. We have a red line. That is, we will not allow war or instability on the Korean pen Peninsula. Uh, was he warning the Americans and Koreans who were holding exercises and still are at the time? Or was he just stating a fact, getting it out there, trying to be, be a bit tough? But mo most of it was not picked up in what I say the popular mainstream Western news. But that's quite a strong comment coming out of China. They're blockading also a couple of Filipino boats as well. That hasn't really made the news. And there was another big explosion there with about 32 people dead. And that's hardly made the news as well. There are some uh, strange things, um, you know, that aren't being covered in China, uh, simply because there's a lot of news out there and at the moment as well. But, you know, a comment like that from the Chinese foreign minister, that that's pretty much stand your ground as well. And there's a lot of different areas around the world that, especially the Middle East, um, that are looking very tender at the moment including Turkey, which I talked about a few weeks back as well. This was another interesting article. All these articles, the links will be in the description on the video and on the website as well. But this is an interesting company from China. I've seen this going on a lot when I'm over in Macau. You can also do this in Hong Kong. But I'll let you read this yourself. You can pretty much take out any amount of cash you want and take away the gold bullion or exchange the gold bullion uh, for cash and as you know a lot of Americans that Steve Wynn owns a lot of casinos in Macau and one of the reasons they've become the largest gambling center in the world is because of this system where people are having to take money out of China um, just so they can go and have fun with their own money in the casinos but if China does crack down on this one day uh, then Steve Wynn's pocketbook and Macau's 
financial state will not look too good and that's why I don't think they will crack down on it. This will be open for a long time still and it's quite a useful way as well to um, move money around because they do have a lot of lo uh, locations now around the world and this loophole um, will be around for a while but it's definitely worth reading the art article I think it was quite well put together but I also found it interesting as well the guy writing the article really failed to mention Steve Wynn's responsibility he, he was saying that, that the manager there kicks out anyone that comes around with a U point, um, sorry, a merchant terminal for U for union pay, but that's because they're independent operators. That's not because they think that they're doing anything wrong. That's because they want the jewelers to get the business that pay the rental space in the casinos. So Steve Wynn uh, could be in trouble here through Chinese regulators or even American regulators have long tentacles. Um, but there is a lot of money laundering going on in. Macau, but also um, there's a lot of people just moving their own money uh, because of the harsh laws in China. If they, if the laws were better, more attractive to capital, I think it was Kerry Packer uh, said it the, the best. My money goes where it's treated the best, and that that's what a lot of um, uh, left wing and socialists don't really understand. That if you create an environment where capital is treated well then people wouldn't have to have so many offshore tax havens, they wouldn't have to jump, jump through hoops just to get their money out so they can gamble or hide a bit of cash in Hong Kong or transfer it around the world. And it's down to the governments. If you read the comments on this Reuters article, one guy at the beginning saying that the government should round up these rich people and shoot 20 of them, and if that doesn't stop it, um, they should shoot another 20 more. Um, we're talking about people taking out their own money using union pay cards and, and this sort of left-wing <laughs> socialist type person is saying that they should be rounded up to teach them a lesson you know so they'll stop it but what what he fails to see is the shoe on the other foot like a good old Irish saying is you've got to look at life from um, another person's point of view walk in their shoes so to speak and the fact is that if you've got money or capital in China, you are worried about uh, it being confiscated or being roughed up, so to speak. So people will move a lot of their money into safer locations. You know, why should people be uh, penalised for that? You know, it should be a human right um, that if you work hard and you've gained certain things, that you should be able to hide those things that you've gained. So long as you've paid tax on them and they've, they've been earned legit, legitimately, you should be able to hide what you earn. And also, you should be able to do with what you earn what you want. Um, not for people to blame uh, people who, who have worked hard, mostly all their lives, uh, to get where they are into that position. Um, they should make the laws easier to move money out of China and then you wouldn't have um, all these shenanigans going on but it's definitely a very interesting article and I think a few of uh, the more astute listeners will get some ideas as well from reading the article Yeah, I talked about it in World Trader Update 1 about uh, Box.com how it was signifying just another little clue that the top was coming um, or a bubble was developing again in the te tech sector and it's mostly been in private companies because you're allowed up to 2,000 shareholders now in an American corporation I think it used to be only 500 so they lobbied for it and they got it in the last three years so they've been allowed to keep these companies private for a lot longer but a lot of them, the ones that are dogs I think for example this company, I'm not saying Box.com is a total dog but they've had it for sort of eight years. This is my assumption. Uh, could be wrong. Um, they realise that it's never really going to make money. There's too much competition out there. So they think now it's time to flog most of it to the public. Or at least get some of it out there. So they can get some of their money back. And they've enlisted a couple of Hollywood people. Not even sure who these people are. I haven't kept up to date with Hollywood for... Well, I never used to, but... I haven't really watched any films for about 15 odd years but I assume these people are quite famous 
and then they're talking about um, being valued at two billion and I went on to read the article in the LA Times and not one area in the article did it say if the company was profitable again that's a sure sign that you know either they that they paid for this placement in some way in some shape or form or you know there is another uh, bubble coming because you write a two-page article about the company you say it's valued at two billion and then uh, you mention all these uh, famous people so that way the public you know the susceptible public feel more comfortable about box.com because there's these very rich people that have invested in it rich people make mistakes as well um, but there's so much competition out there and really what do they do that's different uh, from five to six other different companies there might be a piece of the pie they can gain I'm not saying that um, but I would say that if if indeed the valuation is two billion um, that that is well overvalued but take a look at the article yourself and see see how they're trying to sway the public's opinion into thinking that it might be quite a good opportunity in some ways I've only taken out bits and pieces but the main bulk of the article uh, left you with a very positive glowing feeling about box okay that's it for now uh, with the screens and I just wanted to show you um, what we talked about earlier with the Malaysian Airlines plane disappearance this is the share price of Malaysian Airways and you see here this this spike up uh, back on the 11th of February uh, classic uh, false move you know the markets going down you've got higher lows each low each high is significantly lower than the last one uh, breaks the pivotal point up here flat and then it moves up and then it consolidates here and then on the 19th of February it falls out of bed it gaps down and it gaps down and it gaps down uh, for many many days you know who was distributing these shares over the last two or three months I'm not going to go into any uh, details um, but it seems strange as well because that is you know one of the ways with financial options and uh, selling uh, stock uh, derivatives it, it can lead uh, to certain avenues and you can clearly see here that this market uh, was being primed to go down and you can see um, the day because it happened over the weekend the disappearance you can see the day the market opened on Monday uh, where my mouse is here the big spike down and that could be a distribution spike in terms of that's the bottom of the market um, and they've managed to collect a lot of different shares we'll just have to wait and see how price action develops or um, there's a whole host of downsides still to come and this company's heading into bankruptcy we'll only know in the next few days in terms of price action you know what what this dip meant here but you can clearly see I mean uh, pretty much t you know 20 trading days before the disappearance a heavy downtrend developed and you can see the persistent selling of shares here as well uh, so is it a case of this company's heading for bankruptcy or is it a case of people want to collect more shares um, if you've ever read reminiscence uh, of a stock market trader there's a story like that in there where someone gave a tip to Keen I think it was the old trader Keen and the guy said why aren't you buying and Keen said just wait just wait and watch the price action and in in the end he had it confirmed to him what what the correct thing was to do uh, but sometimes you can't tell from the beginning part of the move what's going to happen but I just thought um, that it was a little bit ominous uh, the way the market, I mean sure it's completely uh, um, it could just be s complete randomness uh, that the market's dipped off so much before such an event um, but it would be interesting and like you say when you've got an investigation all avenues need to be checked out so they can be dismissed uh, but who was selling Malaysia Airlines short and who had put options you know in the month of February and January December, November um, and it could be a complete waste of time looking into that but I think you know with my years of experience of price manipulation it, 
it does look like it's been manipulated there and then with the push upwards here as well where my mouse is uh, that's a classic sign that the market's well well controlled and in uh, very comfortable hands okay that's it for now and i'll speak to you soon take care bye bye now